my name is Andrew Taylor. I'm technical officer from the Association for Specialist Fire Protection, which is the Passive Fire Protection Trade Association. You can see us just down there on stand G62. Um, I've been asked to, to do a, a session this afternoon about uh, compliance and safety for construction, concentrating on passive fire protection. So I'm going to talk about, uh, there's a little bit at the start of this about the re a regulatory update about things we're going to see coming over the next few months and maybe years. Um, and we'll talk about the construction, both from the construction product side and also the inspection for high risk residential buildings. And then we're going to talk about more about in detail about inspection for non high risk other residential buildings and other buildings per se. And, uh, and how they are affected by regulatory reform fire safety order. And hopefully, if time allows at the end, we've got a roving mic and we can do some questions and answers. We keep our fingers crossed. So, why do we need fire protection? And um, why do we need passive fire protection? And in, uh, we talk about passive fire protection is all about keeping fire compartment into a, into a small compartment, stopping the fire from spreading and growing. The picture there on the, the left of the screen is Lacanal House. We all know, which I hope, about the, the Lacanal House disaster, the fire back in 2006, where eight people lost their lives as a result of failure in compartmentation. You may not recognize the building in the center of the picture. Um, how many of you have heard of Cleveland Tower? Now, if you've been to one of the ASFP's webinars, you may have heard of Cleveland Tower. Cleveland Tower is a tower block in Birmingham, and two weeks after the Grenfell fire, there was a fire on the 23rd floor of the Cleveland Tower. And the reason you've never heard of the Cleveland Tower was because the passive fire protection worked, the fire was retrained in the compartment of origin, there was no need for people to evacuate. West Midlands Fire and Rescue went in there, they, they helped a few people out who wanted to be helped out, but that was it. The compartmentation worked, and so as a result, it's not a story. Okay? So compartmentation does work, it does save lives. Okay? But, uh, but you have to think that the legislation we have here is all about protecting life, it's not necessarily about protecting property. So, why do we do this? Well, the, the law says we should do this. The law in building regulations, the Building Act, provision B3, says that we should build a building to maintain structural stability, and we should maintain build a building so that it's able to resist the spread of fire, to enable escape, and the actual legal wording is, is here. Okay, and one of the reasons how ways we do this is we subdivide the building with fire resisting construction to keep the fire small. Another example, this is a, a tower block, um, a recent example, December 2020, a fire in a tower block in Solihull. Again, you've never heard of it, and the reason you never heard of it was because the compartmentation did what it was supposed to do, kept the fire small. There's a statistic for you there. So, of seven and a half thousand fires in a year in large multi-residence blocks of flats, only 16 fires, that's 0.2%, that's only 16 of those fires actually escalated beyond the compartment of origin and needing the evacuation of more than five people. Okay? So, two ways you can look at that. One is compartmentation works. And the other is, that's a fire every three weeks where we have in a tower block where we have to get more than five people out. So that you know, we need to do more. We need we, there's still rooms for improvement, and there's still ways that we can make a difference. I'm sure many of you will have seen uh, and seen and, and hopefully read this document, Building a Safer Future, which was the final report published by Dame Judith Hackett 12 months after the, the Grenfell Tower fire. 
and she looked at the whole construction industry's response to, to fire and made a series of recommendations that could be made as to how we would improve the construction industry in the wake of that fire. And you can see those some of those some of those things there. And the government said yes, well, that's fine, we'll 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 adopt all of those. So where have we got to? Well, I'm sure many of you will know the Fire Safety Act has now come into force. Oh, sorry, has now passed Parliament. It hasn't come into force. We're still waiting for a day when it will come into force. Okay? And the, what the Fire Safety Act, formerly known as the Fire Safety Bill, does is it, it, defines, it defines all sorts of other things that are now to be included in your fire risk assessment, including flat front doors and the external wall space. So the external wall system is deemed a common part of the building, flat front doors deemed a common part of the building, and at some point in the future that's going to come into force and risk assessors will have to start considering those things as well as the stuff that they already do. Beyond that, there's a, there's a, there is a building safety bill going through Parliament at the moment. It's it's gone through the committee stage, and it's now um, the third reading text came out earlier this week. So that's that's the latest situation with it. And um, it's going to give us a greater scrutiny for construction products. It's going to give more scrutiny and more inspections for high-risk residential buildings, and we're going to. We're going to get, we've got a new regulator in the form of the Health and Safety Executive who's going to be doing lots of stuff on uh, regulations for occupancies and ongoing occupancy of high-risk residential buildings. They're also, they've got a committee set up that's interested in the competence of those people who work on not just high-risk residential buildings but the competence of people working on all buildings. So, new construction products regulations, that's something that a lot of ASFP members have been interested in. It's tucked away right at the back of, of the 200 and odd pages of the bill, um, and it's say Schedule 9 is the construction product stuff, and it starts, Secretary of State may make provisions, that Secretary of State, when it is now changed, that Secretary of State, when we get there, will be Michael Gove. And we do, although he, he can, he says the, the bill is open, says he may make provisions, we firmly expect him to make those provisions. And in fact, some of the, the secondary legislation starting to come, come out to be drafted now. And, and it's the, the rule says when this bill passes and goes in, comes into law, those regular construction product stuff will take um, hold two months afterwards for the whole of the UK. It's the one piece of this that actually doesn't have to go through all, all the regional devolved administrations. And there's some stuff in there about an, an area of products we'll call safety critical. And that safety critical is stuff that at the moment doesn't ha is, is deemed safety critical for life protection, but doesn't have uh, a designated standard, it doesn't have a mandatory standard by which it, product performance is assessed. So, Secretary of State gets all these new lovely powers, and the first thing it's underpinned by, which is new for, for us, it's a piece of consumer law about general duty of general duty of safety, the general product safety regulations. Is your product safe? Okay, so that's that's the first thing that hasn't previously applied to construction products, but will do going forward. Uh, there's a code of practice for that being drafted by BSI. It's a PAS 7050. And the secondary legislation that will will come this it was published about about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and so we've got that secondary legislation now. You can find it on the government website. 
safety critical is there, but safety critical is defined as light as, as pre preventing damage if it's not work causes death and or injury. It doesn't make any safety critical. Doesn't make any necessary claims about property protection and things like that. And the, there's a provision in the document which is important that the the product standards for safety critical products are going to come from BSI. So what's going to happen is the bill will be passed, people will be asking the Secretary of State to, to declare which products are safety critical, and then BSI are going to be asked to write product standards for the whole thing. There'll be an implementation period, and then the whole new the new regs will be up and running. Government's also commenced a review of product testing, and we're still waiting to find out what's in that report. That started in summer. We were told it was going to come out in the autumn. Well, it might be the winter now, uh, or it might even be spring. We'll, we'll wait and see where that comes from. And lastly, um, say the Building Safety Bill, it's completed its public bill committee stage. The third reading is out, the, the draft for the third reading is out, but there's no date set for that yet. And then when that goes, has gone through, then we should be able to get that parliamentary approval. We expect it to be sometime in the, in the spring. Um, with the public bill uh, hearings, there was, uh, there was a lot of people lobbying for mandatory third-party certification of products, um, and, uh, but that, that needs to be underpinned by an appropriate level of attestation and verification of constancy of performance. I apologise. In, in other words, the right level of quality system checking and rechecking and monitoring by a third-party organisation. And that's our, as, as an association, that's what we're lobbying for. That's what we think is the right way forward on this, so that safety critical products have to be mandatory marked, mandatory tested, and mandatory certified by a third party to, to show that it's the same same. And I'm going to explain that a bit on this next slide. And I'm glad I'm doing this, because Niall's going to follow me in about uh, an hour, and he'll, he'll the, the, this because this slides on every one of our presentations. So, you know, I apologise if you've seen it so many times before. Um, if, I, if I make a product and put a product on the market, there's three things that I could do. I could write a self-declaration. I can tell you exactly what that product's going to do. I could get somebody to do me a test report, okay, where they test it and then, and then I use that piece of paper, or I could get a third-party certificate. What's the difference between the three? Well, if I tell you I've designed this product to meet a test standard, or I've, it complies with a test standard, you've got no guarantee that what I've said is, is, is correct. You don't know that. Okay? I could be making it up. Okay? Was it tested? Was the test impartial? You know, there's, there's no guarantee. So obviously, with that, there's a consequent level of risk. Now, if I have a test report where I've gone to a third-party laboratory and I've got them to test it, I, well, I did that on one particular day, and so my product was tested on that day, so I have a report. It's a snapshot in performance. Some people will take that and say I have a certificate. It's not. It's a test report. Okay? But it's a test report. It's only the performance of the thing on the day it was tested. Okay? And yes, you might have achieved that, but is that product that you're getting the same as the one? that was tested when I tested ran my test months ago, years ago, whenever. And, and has there been any changes to the design, to the raw materials, to the stuff that goes into it? And so as a result of that, you're still left with a level of risk. However, third-party certification schemes, not only do they test it and properly test it and give you a statement of, of performance, but as well as that, they all audit the product's conformity, they make sure that the product that's made today is the same as the one that was tested, and they so they're ensuring that the design you're getting is the correct thing. That's the, the route to confidence. That's the only route to confidence. Okay, so that's why we've been lobbying hard to the, within Building Safety Bill and the like to say third-party certification for material construction products is the way of the future. Now, 
In term, we mentioned in, in, in terms of building safety bill, we've got the, the regulator. There's a new regulator in, under the auspices of HSE. Um, and we, the, there's a, the HSE has a website there. If you were interested in what they're doing and, and, and what they're talking about, you know, have a look on their website. And because the, there's there is stuff that comes on there that will will help you, uh, and it's giving their first thoughts as they're getting used to this new role that they're doing. Okay? And they're coming up with a plan and they're going to let us know what that is. Um, now the health and safety executive is looking at implementing the stages of the three gateways that was were identified in the Hackett report. Okay? The first gateway is uh, planning permission and gives you permission to use the land. And in effect, if you want to plan a high-risk residential building, you already have to do that now. That gateway went live in August. So you have to already have, a, before you can get planning permission to build one of these, you have to get HSE's involvement and you have to actually you have to actually start to get permission to use the land from them and, and, and get permission to draw up your plans. Once you've done that, the, the next two gateways will come and that second gateway is full plans approval, which is permission to construct. And the third gateway is permission to occupy. Okay? And when you get to the third gateway, he says, one of the things that you're going to need, you get that they will give you a building safety certificate, and then there will be an ongoing review of that building certificate within the safety case. And we'll talk more about safety case in a couple of slides time. So that's that's a very very brief um, sort of overview of what's involved from gateway one through permission to to, to, to to use the land, permission to plan, yeah, once you've designed it, permission to construct a gateway two, once you've built it, permission to occupy a gateway three, and the ongoing stuff in, within the occupation phase. There's a bit more detail of it on that slide of what's involved here. Okay, and you can see you can see whether well, the planning permission phase, the design phase, so you'll be checked against building regulations, against your design codes. And then here in gateway three, the safety case, it's you, 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 the control chain passes over to the occupier and, and the buildings and the building safety manager, and, and these are all the things that he will he or she will need going forwards in in, in use as the building goes forward okay so um, one of the new things here that's covered for high-risk residential and this is not just for new build high-risk residential but it's going to be enforced for existing high-risk residential as well is this concept of a safety case and that's the best I could do for a piece of clip art for a safety case I apologize all right but you are going to have to pull together a safety case for a, for high risk residential buildings and at the moment that high risk is set at is set at 18 meters seven stories there is talk of a, of a risk based approach for it but the quick key question will be that this bulk text in bold here you identify the building safety risks in the building and show how you manage them um, on an ongoing basis so as to minimize the risks keep the building safe all right that's that's the key thing that underpins the safety cases and we there's been a, there's a number of times we've talked about this and there's uh, webinars people have said well what's it going to look like what's going to be involved and and the answer is that at the last um, we've got an early message from HSE as to what's involved. They've published a, a document about principles of safety cases. And, and there's a whole list of things that are in uh, that are mentioned in that document that you need to put into a safety case. Okay? So, so there's, there's various bits and pieces that you would need to consider. The whole point of the safety case is to give confidence to the occupants that the building is safe. Okay? So those are the sorts of things you should be you should be considering. Okay? And now one of the things that they said how to think, how would you achieve this? There's a whole section about what you should actually be thinking about as you write this. You know, what what the possibilities 
possible incidents are, what passive fire protection measures you've got in place to prevent them from escalating. Do you know it's intact? Do you know it will work? How do you know it's safe? Okay, so that's all the sorts of questions that we're, that takes you back to that big bold block of text from a couple of slides ago. Those are the questions. And a final key message for any of you that are listening, that are involved in the management of high-risk residential buildings, um, don't wait for the legislation to be finalised. You can go back and you should be going back and starting asking those questions now, because it's going to come. You know, what is, how is the building used? What's it for? How do the systems within your building interact? Which elements are safety critical and, and, and the likes? And then think about it from that point of view. Okay, so we talked a lot about, about high, high risk residential buildings. What about non high risk residential buildings? Well, tucked away in the back of ADB quite often forgotten, certainly 10 years ago it was paid absolutely no heed, is a thing called Regulation 38. So it applies to all buildings in scope of regulatory reform, which is virtually every building apart from private dwellings. Um, and, and it makes advice on the sorts of information, the sorts of records that should be prepared during construction and handed over to the building occupier so that the building occupier can, can, can have the necessary um, fire risk assessments done. And all this, the, the sort of information in the back of Reg 38, you know, in, for complex buildings you need information on all your passive fire safety build measures. You certainly need information on where all the fire separating elements are. And, reg and regulatory reform fire risk assessment, you need to make sure that all your escape routes are properly inspected. So one of the we you know, what should that regulator reform or the Reg 38 look like, the info look like? You know, and the answer is the more detail the better. Because at some point in the future a fire risk assessor is going to come along and want to look at your building and want to and want to work out whether your building is properly protected. So, so the more information you can give the fire risk assessor, the better. So for instance, fire stops, you know, they should all have ID references. In, you know, in the modern age now, all have ID references. It's all done on your, your smartphone. And, and the software packages where you take a picture of the hole, you take a picture of the, of, the, of the first fix going in, you take a picture of the services, you take a picture of all the fire seal as you build it, step by step by step. And then at the end, you take a picture of the whole thing with a sticker on it, with a QR code, and, and attach to a copy of the test certificate to that, third party certificate to that, and you've got a full record of everything that was done. And that's, the, the, you know, those systems are out there today. And if you've got that, then a risk, a fire risk assessor can come along and look at that and think, that condition's okay, here's the record of what it is, job done. I can leave it alone with a type one, common parts, non-invasive inspection with confidence. If I haven't got that, well then maybe I'm going to need to do an invasive inspection. Maybe if I need to look at what this is, can I just take it at face value or do I have to pull something apart and, and reinstate it? So there's a lot more work to be done in that situation. For modern buildings, you should already have the layout, the, the building layout. The responsible person that's in there should have the building layout. Um, on, on either do through CDM or for Reg 38. Um, and statutory guidance, all the statutory guidance, be that ADB or the BS 9991 should we should have lots of guidance on what passive fire protection measures are in there, what they're for, and how they've been done. And you need that sort of information to enable you to conduct a decent fire risk assessment. Older buildings, you, you're probably going to have to start from scratch because the records aren't necessarily there. So some of that will need to be, you'll need to start by what it is and going back to basics and, and, and planning from that and creating a document that actually lists all this. 
the most important thing with a fire risk assessment order, uh, audit is that, is that you, you, your main focus of concentration is escape routes. Okay, so uh, all the common parts, all the escape routes, make sure that uh, you know everything that's going on on all the escape routes. And of course, as a result of the new Fire Safety Act at number six there, external, you know, add, add on to that, external walls. You only do the other items of PFP while you're doing the primarily while you're doing the escape routes. And how do you inspect it? Well, you might have to remove some false ceiling tiles, have a look around the, the, the compartment walls. We we did an inspection of, of about 18 months, two years back. We lifted a false ceiling. We were, we were taken along by a team contractor who said, "Done all this. This is all brilliant. Finished it a month ago." We went. We lifted up a false ceiling tile, and in the intervening month, a telecoms engineer had come in and passed a category five cables through the particular above the fire door and precision cut a hole with a claw hammer from either side. Just smash the smash the wall down, job done, cable through, you're thinking what to do. Um, you can of course use a remote camera, use an endoscope, you can get these this, this sort of stuff. Now this looks really quite fancy and expensive. I've got one that Bluetooth with my phone that costs 20 quid from Amazon. That's all you need. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, check status of remedial works, hence my tail. Okay? And, but you need to know if you're re enough to recognise that something's wrong. It's not always just, a, not always there's a big hole there. Well, yeah, actually it is always there's a big hole there. Other things to look at. Wall and ceiling linings, watching for extensive overpainting, loads and loads of loads and loads of paint. Because it's, you know, if you put 27 layers of paint on it, it will burn like crazy. Um, and of course, management issues to keep escape routes clean, clear, free from stuff. I mean, wall hangings here. You know, fabrics can be flame retarded, but are they? Big area of concentration when you're talking about uh, escape routes, fire doors, of course. So, you know, is it a fire door? Are there gaps? Are there labels? Are there, are there, are there, are there the quality labels, the quality plugs that tells you what the book door is meant to do? Has it been maintained? Is it intact? Have you got the suit suitable CE marks, iron mongery, three proper hinges? Um, does it operate properly? So does the self closer work? You know, and, 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 and the likes. So there's a load of things to check, and that's a load of things here to check that sort of make sure it's right, uh, and some examples where maybe it's not right. Um, it's not my, it's it, it void at the top of the door where there's the channel being taken out the door. The, um, the, the the door frames there, but to be honest, you've got you've got foam around the around the door frame at the back of the door. Has that been properly tested and assured? There are some that are tested, but not everyone is. Um, and broken hinges, you know. Uh, okay, so th so there's that. Uh, there's also intermessent strips used as a smoke seal if you've got a smoke resisting door. And the fire, so some doors have intermessent strips, some doors have intermessent and smoke seal strips. So are they around the, are, are they there, are they present? Um, commonly they get overpainted by mistake and they shouldn't be, so check that. Um, and then of course the door closer, it, it, it hold open device, does it automatically release? Does the closer actually work? These things are all meant to be checked of course, very regularly, so have they been? And then the last one on doors, panic exit devices. Uh, it's not necessarily PFP, but obviously it's important if it's on an escape route. Uh, air transfer grills, uh, is it a thermally activated one? And, and, or is it linked to the fire protection alarm scheme? Has it been checked? Okay. And of course, the, 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 the quality plugs that you might find in the, in the, button, in the side of the door. You know, have you got records to prove that you know what you're, you're dealing with and that it's going to give you the proper fire resistance performance? Walls, floors and ceilings, you know, don't necessarily assume the existing construction is okay. Is it a fire resisting system? Has it been properly tested? Has it got certification? And has the layout of the thing been moved? 
since since it was designed and installed and as people played around with the layout and how's that affected what's gone on so what records are there you know I mean we do see some some common shockers within the world of doors and ceiling you know there's a that's the, the they take the plasterboard up to, to a certain height then they get to the false ceiling and above the false well we haven't they haven't bothered it hasn't been bothered to finish it off clearly inadequate and, and there's, there's a, this is a, a, a hole in the floor protected by some of that fire resistant plasterboard out of fire resistant hardboard okay so you know the, the, there's issues there um, penetrating services service pipes cables have to go through walls here's some examples of some of the good stuff we've got labels on there we, it's all properly installed has it, been, has it been suitably done have we got is it in good condition are there any holes is, is it third party certified product is it a third party certified installer what records have we got that all looks pretty good that all looks pretty shocking okay um, here we've got we've got cables going through a wall with with no fire protection here we've got a riser covered with a, a magic foam floor um, don't know how load bearing that magic foam is so you know this is uh, well I'll let you uh, work on that one don't stand on it please okay here's an example of one that's really really obviously super well done um, with the document our technical guidance document 17 that gives you a code of practice for installing and inspecting fire stopping and there's a, there's a, 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 a table identifying the type and level of inspection needed and when you should do it and that's the a, a summary of the table um, that's a summary of the table from it um, so it explains you know during during installation inspect all of it and if you've got a third party certified contractor then maybe they can do that and to explain what they're doing a handover maybe get somebody else to inspect 20 percent if you inspect if you put any building area work in and around the fire stopping inspect it again okay and then annually well annually inspect all those areas next to uh, the escape routes okay and say so that's the, the making the same point and again you know get your records from your installers that tells you what they've been done it will help in the long run with and, and keep those records so it will help in the long run with fire risk assessment it's the same same with ducts and fire stopped good condition um, and, and which method of those ducts and dampers using to maintain the compartmentation because that's what fire resisting ducts and dampers are about they're about maintaining the original compartmentation that you have where you pass a duct and where you're passing ducts through and either a duct or a damper they're, they're, they're complementary technologies and you can use them in different ways to maintain the compartmentation those are some scenarios from, um, from, from BS 9999. Okay, so there's, they're, they're, they're useful technologies, but you've got to consider how you design them, and this is one of my favourite pictures. Um, because here we have, you know, we've got ducts, we've got dampers, we've got cell beams, we've got a compartment wall, and there's absolutely no fire resistance there whatsoever. Because, the, you know, the dampers are not in the plane of the wall. The dampers are not even in the plane of the cell beam. There's, no, there's big holes around the cell beams where the front cell beams wear that. The duct performance and the damp performance probably hasn't been evaluated passing through the cell beam. Has the cell beam been evaluated with the duct and damper passing through it? They're all tested to different things. So you need to consider as you bring these systems together how they're going to interact. And of course beyond that, well, there's no labels and there's no records for what they were. And again, same same information as we said before. There's a TGD there that's got the sort of same table in that explains how to assess and, and what sort of reasonable um, inspection you might be inspected to do on passive fire resistant systems for ducts and dampers. And make sure that the fire stopping around the duct and damper is also important as the duct and damper itself.
Sandwich panels, obviously, we're going to start. We're going to start. Loop, you need to look at sandwich panels as if they're part of an internal wall system and they're on your escape route. All this lot becomes very, very relevant to make sure that they're going to be behave properly in fire. And now, as we get to external wall systems coming into scope of this, the same, same as well. Same, same as well. So, and there's a whole list of, of questions there. Well, what's the core material? Have, have, they, have any repairs been done? Is that is that material in the middle combustible? And if so, what what have you done to make sure that you can't? It can't be seen. It can't. So it can't be attacked by fire. And of course, you know, we've, we talked about this. Cladding is soon going to be deemed common parts, and therefore it's going to come on into scope of all this. And the usual questions: What's the core? What's the insulation? Have the cavity barriers been fitted? And how's that whole thing been put together? Has that whole thing been put together by virtue of a test of, a, of a, an assessment? Has it had a test, a system test, an 8414 test? What's the underpinning thing behind it? Um, in terms of fire risk assessment, structural fire protection, you don't necessarily need to go looking too much for structural fire protection. It's not that, it, it's uh, it only where it actually is visible within the escape route. Uh, is it in good condition? Is it complete? Um, and again, the same with cavity barriers, where visible, are they complete? Are they doing the job? Uh, and if there are any, it, but if you're unclear about what to do, then call in a third party inspector who, who, who gets these technologies. So, I say we've got a, a number of technical guidance documents on the ASFP website to help with inspection. Okay, all of these technical guidance documents give you a, a, a site inspection methodology, a performer checklist for what to do and how to do it, um, and, and the likes. And with a, a note that say that not all the inspection methodologies are the exact same; they are subtly different for each individual uh, technology. We've also got a, a guide on what to look for when undertaking a, a fire risk assessment of passive fire protection systems. I'll be honest, it's, it, it, it's been around for some years. It's still valid. It's not going to be valid soon. There's going to have to be a major rewrite on it when the Building Safety Bill and the Fire Safety Act come into force, which is something we've got to consider. We're waiting on that and then we'll be doing it. But it's, it's, it, it, you know, it's come, it, this was a version from 2011 and it's still, as, it's still pretty relevant today. Uh, it gives you some information on the role of fire risk assessment, um, how to evaluate passive fire protection associated with the means of escape, uh, but it doesn't give you information on full survey complaints. Okay? But it might help you if you're fire risk assessment and if you're doing that. All right? And then beyond that, there's one and a half to three pages on each type of passive fire protection pictures of what to look for, good and bad. You've seen some you've seen some examples of good and bad and I hope you recognise them appropriately. Um, and, and there's annexes with more information, etc etc. There is also in each of these things a checklist for each type of construction um, for what you would need to look at related to means of escape. Okay? Um, have I gone oh no. okay. Alright, and that's uh, references to uh, clauses in the document with further information. And, and the good news is, this is my last slide. Um, so, passive fire protection, I would say, you only need to, to use it once. Um, you know, and from an ASFP standpoint, we'd say, if, if you're going to do this, use a third-party certified product, use a third-party certified installer. And ASFP's got lots of member companies out there who are, who are third-party certified manufacturers, third-party certified installers, um, and, and they've, they've, they've got the right skills, hopefully, within these things. If you inspect it to the protocols we've got and keep records covering the above, then that gives you the best shot going forward. And with that, I'll say thank you very much. I